Gentlemen, start your engines. The command has been given. The engines start to scream. 27 drivers are ready. We're ready for the start of the Toyota Grand Prix of Long Beach. Street racing. It's frantic and tight. To negotiate this traffic jam, you need Lady Luck. She was with Jill DeFerrin when he spun at Japan, but miraculously maintained control to finish second. Adrian Fernandez felt her magic, claiming his second consecutive victory at Motegi on nothing but fumes. She rode with Greg Moore during his late race spin, carrying him to the finish line to retain his championship lead. But for Michael Andretti, she marked strong performances at Homestead in Japan with problems in the pits. Who will Lady Luck be riding with today at the Toyota Grand Prix of Long Beach? It's time to find out. Champ cars are ready. They're already rolling on this new circuit here as we celebrate the 25th anniversary of the Toyota Grand Prix of Long Beach. There is a lot going on. We begin with Jan Bikas. There is, Paul, and yesterday morning, Tony Kanaan did not have a good morning. The gearbox on his primary car blew up. He brought it here on pit road. They switched to the backup car. He went out, although it was set up identically, that car was a half a second faster. In the afternoon, he put it on the pole, his first career pole, and then, this morning, he was also the fastest man in the warm-up. Harry Gerald? For Dario Franchitti, this weekend started out like a dream weekend in Southern California. He was on the provisional pole on Friday, but Saturday morning, he had a crash in that new complex of the racetrack, turn two. It significantly damaged the car, had to go to the backup car. He brought it right out in the final qualifying run and came within just two hundredths of a second of catching Canaan. We're shaping up for a tremendous battle. Paul, I don't know about you, but we're ready for a great day at the beach. We are having fun celebrating this 25th anniversary here, but there is one enormous question. It's turn one. Paul, for 24 years, the drivers have hurled themselves down shoreline at speeds approaching 200 miles an hour. They've been hard on the brakes and then going right. This year, the tracks change. They're hard on the brakes and going left into a brand new section. It's narrow, it's slick, it's created some problems for the drivers. This was Scott Pruitt. He narrowly missed the barrier. Mauricio Guzman, he caught it head on. On board with Richie Hurd. He clips the inside wall. His session's over. How will this affect the outcome of the race? We're not sure, but one thing's for sure, Paul. At the start of this race, all heck's going to break loose. Here's the way they qualify. Tony Kanaan, the first pole of his career. Dario Franchitti alongside. He finished second here last year. In the second row, Brian Herta. Last year at Long Beach, he started from the pole, finished third. His teammate, Mac Pappas, is alongside. The third row, Juan Montoya. Keep an eye on him. And Adrian Fernandez, the winner last week in Motegi. In row four, Jill DeFerrin and Greg Moore, who won the season opener. The fifth row, Jimmy Vassar and Paul Tracy. Row number six, Christian Fittipaldi and Mark Blundell. The seventh row, Michael Andretti. His first career win was here. And Mauricio Guzman. P.J. Jones and Cristiano Damana. Cristiano has the fastest Toyota engine. Patrick Carpentier and Elio Castro Nevis in row nine. The tenth row, Tarso Marquez and Scott Pruitt. In row 11, Robbie Gordon and Alex Barron. The twelfth row, Michelle Jourdain Jr. and Rishi Hearn. In row 13, Walter Salez and Shigeaki Hattori. And alone in the last row, Luis Garcia Jr. Those are the 27 cars. Now, here today, 85 laps is the distance. The pit window opens at lap 15. We got plenty of onboard cameras for you. Here's the view of the Toyota Renard of Robbie Gordon. Quick all weekend, just couldn't put it together in qualifying. Cristiano D'Amato, the quickest Toyota. What a guy this guy is. He's got great potential, Paul, for a great race. Mike Landretti, the Ford Swift. He was the 86 winner here, looking for his first win this year. Jill DeFerrin, this is a great view. He's always so quick here. Will today be his day? Along with Juan Montoya, this kid is a rocket. Expect fireworks. Those are the onboard cameras for you, the field. 
now getting ready to move into formation. They were told that they should come off of the last turn, which of course is a hairpin here, single file, and then move into their rows of two, hoping to get at least six of the rows off the corner before the green flag comes out. The look down on Seaside as they move toward that final turn. The pace car is the Toyota Solara. They will button up to the back of that car and Tony Kanaan, the 40th man in cart history K1, to sit on care, the take pole. Take care of your tires here on the first couple laps. Take care of your tires. Boy, there is one of the stories right there, too. In these hot temperatures in the 90s, keeping track of the tires. And how are you going to fuel the cars in this race? Some think you could do this one on one pit stop. Keep these cars off, I'll let you know. Get ready for green. Position two on the map. Tony Kanan brings the field down now. And we go green. Now the critical turn lies just ahead at the end of shoreline. The field screams down for shoreline. The rest of the field comes off the corner slowly. Tony Kanan moves to the front. Herta challenges to the inside into that first turn. Front of the field through their clean. They've made it through the two critical parts now. Herta in the lead, followed by Kanan. Brankini is third. joined what is the circuit formerly used here for the champ cars with Brian Herta leading the field good move on the start Tony Kanan in second Frank Kitty sits back in third Herta moved up from the second row to take the lead this is an incredible piece of driving by these drivers Paul the support races have already had multiple accidents in that new section of the track it just shows these guys are the best in the world they got through there they're trying to save tires save fuel as you mentioned they might be able to do this in one stop if they've got long enough yellows but so far it's been very very clean oh did you see montoya kick that thing sideways as he came off the hairpin battle at the front of the field and already somebody in pulling trouble and this is at the hairpin that of course is patrick carpentier sideways they will go for local yellow only and they should be able to clear that car before the field comes around again the great fear is here, Paul, is with this new section, as narrow as it is, if a car gets sideways, it will block the track, forcing a red flag situation. The other traditional problem has always been up where Patrick Carpentier has just spun. Car safety team is right on the spot to get that car out of the way, but we watch Brian Herta doing a great job trying to find the balance between conserving fuel and his tires, pushing just hard enough to keep the guys behind him, but not so hard that he has to come in early. You have to think about Carpentier's second race. Look at Kanan, Kanan. Off of Seaside, drops to the inside, makes the pass, pick up the lead. Carpentier, we're going to say, now two races in a row has problems in the early going. Yellow still wave there. They'll be using, by the way, the international rules, which means that they have to pass that green flag beyond the incident before they can resume racing anytime there's a local yellow. They're trying to get rid of any ambiguity of where you can pass and where you can't pass. And by going to the FIA rules, that's now cleared that up. Third in this picture there, Paul, is Dario Franchitti. He's one of, the, one of the best in the business of going the quickest on the least amount of fuel and conserving his tires. We'll see how that'll play out. Jan Vigas, what's the story on Carpentier? Carpentier, Paul, has been in the pits. They put four fresh tires, and they checked the right rear corner. They were concerned about it. They think it's okay. He's got fresh rubber, but obviously he's lost a lot of time. And Franchini makes his move on Herta. So Franchini moves up to second place, now behind Tony Kanan. They begin to bubble at the top three. Dario Franchitti, brilliant last year, not only in the street courses, but also the road courses. If you watch him, he's so smooth and so elegant in his driving styles, it's hard to tell when he's going fast. He's just going fast all the time. It's only going to take him a few corners, Paul, and he'll haul up right on the back of Tony Kanaan. And then we'll see how this young Brazilian driver handles the pressure from one of the best road course drivers in the business. Erna drops back to third place. That's where he qualified. His teammate Max Pappas just behind him now. Followed by Juan Montoya. You're on board with Montoya. Boy, keep an eye on his hands. Just watch this kid throw the car. We saw him shift down from sixth down to second gear. He'll leave it in second gear all the way through this complex. That Honda motor spinning up to 15,000 RPM. 
We saw him short shift up to third there, Paul. That's a strategy not only to try to conserve fuel, but also tires. You can see the car in front of him sliding. That's Max Pappas. The problem is there, Paul, it falls drastically off camber. It's hard to pick up on the camera, but it's a six degree slope change as they come through. He's up to fourth, fifth gear there. Uh, Richie Hearn's got a problem. He's picked up one of the banners from the edge of the racetrack. Now the problem here, keep going, if it keep had, going, you're fine. had it stayed on, would have been cooling. Well, and always trying to get the sponsor's worry, name in there, fine. Paul. It was a Toyota banner. You could hear his team tell him once he got rid of the banner just to stay on it. We'll have to keep an eye on Richie Hearn's car because we are not sure. Well, we see one thing, Parker, no mirror on one side. He's lost the right side mirror, Paul. That's not critical going down into the turn one area, but it certainly is on the other corners on the track. Now, Richie Hearn will struggle to find himself back up in the field. He currently runs 22nd. Marquez pushed Robbie right out of the barriers there. He clipped it, and that that uh, banner, unfortunately, I think, was collected by Richie Hearn. All right, so that pretty well explains the whole thing. There's Hearn with the banner, but as long as he has that banner there, he wasn't getting cooling into the right side of the uh, race car, into the coolers on that side. In this temperature, you don't want that to go too long. You can see how rough this track is, Paul. Look at him fight that wheel. Back to the front of the field, Tony Kanaan leading for the first time in his champ car career. And Dario Franchitti is right there. Then it's about three seconds back to the third place car, Brian Herta. And Paul, we can add a word, a word on Brian Herta. If we were talking about the possibility of fuel conservation, a radio message to Brian from the pits, Bobby Rahal telling him, use the button all you want. The button, of course, is one of those buttons on the steering wheel that gives you that full fuel efficiency, gives you a couple extra hundred revs, and possibly in a critical situation, it's enough to make a critical pass. A little further back, Max Papp is trying to hold off last week's winner, Adrian Fernandez. Battle for sixth place. Now we call that the overtaker, the candy button, Paul. What happens, they can set the fuel mixture to be as lean as they want, to be as conservative as they want. But when they push that button, it puts the engine to full power, full rich, advances the timing. But each engine manufacturer has a maximum number of times that you can insert those quarters into the video machine to get that extra boost of power. So right now, they're telling him to use it all he wants. But at some point, you're out of you're out of plays, out of bonus laps. Just behind this fight, Jill DeFerrin, Greg Moore, they're ready to attack. Kanan, Frankiti, Herta, top of the field. Again on shoreline, heading down for that series of turns that they call the complex, mostly because it is. It actually passes between the fountain that you'll see here in a second and the beautiful new aquarium that they have built in the past season here at Long Beach, the city that has literally grown to success around this race in the past 25 years. Adrian Fernandez chasing Max. This is the first time that Patrick Racing has run their Swift chassis this year. Remember, Adrian won just two weeks ago in Japan in a conglomeration, which they called affectionately Frankenstein, a 97, 98, 99 Renard. And now he's in the Swift trying to hunt Max down for fifth place. And with Tony Kanan as the leader, as a matter of fact, despite the battle for the lead of this race, they are now back in exactly the same order that they qualified, first through 17th. Paul Page with Parker Stoughton Johnstone. We now have eight laps into the record book. Tony Kanan is still the leader. We're back taking a look at the battle between Fernandez and Pappas. Juan Montoya was able to split in between Pappas and Herta now occupies for it. Now you're riding with Jill DeFerrin sitting just behind that fight. Jill DeFerrin, one of the few competitors on Goodyear tires. Jill told us that they came here with a little too conservative of a tire. It's a little too hard for the slick track condition, but he qualified extremely well. He's always been very, very fast at Long Beach, and now he's just trying to hunt these guys down, Paul. Remember, he's all alone in a sea of Firestone tires trying to get the most out of those Goodyears. Yeah, with Greg Moore, Jimmy Vassar, and Paul Tracy all lined up right behind him. Jan Vegas? Yes, in regards to those Goodyear tires, this is exactly what Jill DeFerrin and Goodyear want. A very hot day and want to put pressure on Firestone cars. 
drivers because the Firestone tire that was brought here was very aggressive. Yes, it's very fast, but if these drivers on Firestones don't take care of them, they could wear them out, and that could really benefit Goodyear. But, John, you talk to the Firestone people, and they say the hotter, the better. They welcome that challenge. They like the heat. It's going to be interesting to see how this plays out. And already we're hearing conflicting uh, approaches to this fuel conservation business because Paul Tracy has been reminded, keep an eye on your fuel. Don't let it get you in trouble. And the word to Christian Fittipaldi repeatedly, save your tires. Save your tires. He's on Firestone. We got a good glimpse for a second there of Christian Fittipaldi jumping out, trying to make a move on Paul Tracy. He did not. We are back at the front of the field. This is where the battle lies, and they have pulled well away from the rest of the race. Kanan and Frankiti. And Kanan steadily can sit in front of Frankiti. I have not seen Frankiti really move on him in a corner. There are only four cars in the 63 second bracket. Paul, those are the top four. Everybody else is uh, actually right now. There are only two cars in the 64 second bracket. Everybody else is back in the 65s and slower. So obviously Tony and Dario pushing very hard. Everybody else looking at different strategies to see if they get a yellow. Can they make it in one stop? Now the guys that are going full power. They've obviously committed to a two stop strategy. The concern is not so much the, the fuel Paul, but the tires. Can the tires last if you try to make it in one stop and so far the consensus seems to be they can't you're trying to unleash 900 horsepower off these hairpins it lights up the rear tires the tire wear just isn't good enough i think to make it in one stop no, but you know this race is very difficult to predict on one hand 85 laps that's not all that far uh, the circuit now is 1.82 miles around last year it was 1.574 but given that and the shorter distance now you start to think, well, do I want to make this a two-stop race? Do I want to reach for one? And then you have to go back and look over the history of the race and how the caution periods, full course cautions figured in. They figured in predominantly in the past. Today we've been clean. Thus far we've got 11 laps into the book. But at any moment someone can turn sideways in that new section up in the hairpin and change the whole complexity of this race. But so far it's been very, very clean. There are lots of accidents in the support race, but so far these guys are standing on it. Now let's take a look at our Circuit City telemetry on board Richie Hearn's car. Graph is miles an hour, and boy, watch this thing swing. Richie, one of the few drivers down to first gear at the fountain corner. Watch how hard this thing accelerates once he gets back onto the old section of the track, Paul. Watch it here. Look at it jump. Can you imagine going shopping on Sunday afternoon with that kind of horsepower? So, Richie Hearn, you got an idea as he heads down behind Walter Salas into the, the turn nine area. And back at the front of the field, Tony Kanan is still just pouring it on. Gary, I got to ask you about the fuel situation on this car. Paul, I'm sorry. I was in a conversation here. We were just checking on the well-being of Robbie Gordon, and I, I didn't hear all of that lead in. Well, as we watch Tony throw it really sideways, let, let me go down the, down the pits and ask John. Well, the situation for Tony Kanan, I just spoke with Steve Horn, who's going to make the calls, and he said at the start of this race, they already were going to go for a two-stop strategy. So that would be most likely why you're seeing him running as quickly as they are. They're going to try and get away from the field and then make two stops. They're not going to try and gamble and go for one. The leader just handles up Luis Garcia Jr. now. Franchitti does the same. Christian Fittipaldi finally was able to attack and get around Paul Tracy for 10th place. Tarso Marquez also was able to get around Scott Pruitt and now sits in 18th place. The only two passes that we've had in the uh, past few seconds here on the track. Well, there's and, a lot of speculation. Oh, oh, Gordon's off again. A lot of smoke at the back of that car, Paul. We don't know if he just overshot the corner or actually has a problem. We'll see if he can keep it running and get back on the circuit. Robbie Gordon, really, th this is his local track. He wants to get back into the fight. That's a nice piece of driving, Paul, to spin that car around in such tight confines, except I think he just clipped the tires there with the left rear. Showman Robbie Gordon, he is good. Back onto the track itself. Montoya and Brian Herta. Montoya right there. 
This young Colombian, Paul, from the moment he showed up at Long Beach, was third quickest in the opening practice sessions. He has absolutely no fear, no concern, other than being absolutely the fastest driver on the track. He is amazing to watch. And, you know, like many of the great drivers, he has kind of a, a shy little smile. Almost looks at you a, a head down when he talks, but obviously is enjoying himself. And, hey, if you got a ride with Target Chip Ganassi, I think I'd probably be a pretty happy guy, too. The so Tony Kanaan at the front, Frank Katie second, Brian Herta being worried very much by Juan Montoya. Back at the Toyota Grand Prix of Long Beach, a couple of teammates, Blundell and Guzman, both having problems next Sunday at 1 o'clock. Bobby Labonte, the defending champion. It's the Die Hard 500 from Talladega. We'll have the coverage. Now, we've had a couple of things going on. We start with Gary. In the Pac West pit, both drivers, Mauricio Guzman and Mark Blundell, in. You see why. Firestone engineers taking a look at what may have happened here as the rear tires went down for both of the Pac West drivers. We've also had reports from Dario Franchitti, Christian Fittipaldi, and Paul Mon uh, Montoya that they say their rear tires are gone as well. Whoa. I don't know if we've got a problem Excuse me, Gary. Or not. I'm going to interrupt you just a second. Luis Garcia, that's the uh, hairpin, of course, setting off a little offline. Shouldn't be a problem. Just want to note he's there. Gary Gerald. Well, we just we don't know if we've got a, a developing tire problem or not, but suddenly drivers reporting that they're losing grip with the rears. Let's uh, check in also with Jan. Well, I believe that for Mauricio Guzman, Gary, there was contact with P.J. Jones, and P.J. Jones says that his car is okay. There was contact with the front wing. Now, for some reason, they have to go to yellow flag here. People are saying this is in the pit window for a two-stop race. So keep your eye to see if we get a full course yellow. Also, our leader, Kanan, is starting to pick up some push. The front of the car not gripping the way he wants. Well, we opened the pit window actually three laps ago at the 15th lap. You're on board with Montoya. Fernandez just jumped around Pappas, picked up fifth place. This is the stage of the race, Paul, where these guys are starting to get a feel for how their cars are working on half tanks, whether they're going to pick up a balance change. They're talking to their crews to try to figure out if they can make a, make a wing adjustment or tire pressure change on that first round of stops. We should be able to see some guys moving forward as they have their cars working better and better, other guys moving back as they run into chassis problems. Boy, and look at this lineup. Everybody stacked up now behind Max Pappas after Fernandez was able to get around. Now DeFerrin is there ready to go to work. Christian Fittipaldi's just moved past Jimmy Vassar for ninth. Catching Lucas someone right here. here. Yeah, catching someone here, Paul, is one thing. Passing them is something else. To do it, you either have to have a, an ex a superior car or just take a huge risk when you've got someone who dives in as deep on the brakes as Max does. He drives just like his predecessor, Bobby Rahal, goes in very, very deep. That means you've got to try to set him up, try to use your horsepower, try to wait for him to make a significant mistake. And if he doesn't make it, getting around him takes just a very brave move. Yeah, but look at that lineup. They're all lined up right now, ready to take focus on Max Pappas. DeFerrin actually looked out for a second as they went into turn nine off of Seaside. They're now on shoreline once again. Christian Fittipaldi is right there. Greg Moore lined up behind Christian. That's Paul Tracy just behind Greg Moore. And we should point out, it's hot outside today, Paul, in this new section of track. Uh, here we see Cristiano uh, D'Amata down one of the escape roads. Yeah, that's uh, that car's sound. I can't, oh, he's working on the gearbox. Maybe he does have some power. You can see no, the skid marks so. where he spun in, Paul. It looks like it happened under braking or during a downshift. When you race a course like this, back to that battle, when you race a course like this, the whole thing is a concrete canyon with just a couple of runoff areas. Those areas wisely placed there by the officials where it is most likely that you would run off. Here's what happened to Cristiano D'Amata. Just overcooked that corner big time. He had someone going down the inside of him, trying to outbreak him. He tried to hold him off on the outside. He locked the rear as a simple 180 degree spin. And they're pulling him back. So no damage to the car. If he can get it refired, he can jump back into this race. But I was about to say, with this new section of track, it's very demanding, not only physically, but also mentally. It takes a lot of concentration to get through this very tight, slippery section quickly, lap after lap after lap. The old course, you had two long straightaways to relax, to, to refocus your attention, to talk to your team. But now, you have very little time before you're right back into the thick of things. Jill DeFerrin continues to work on 
Max Pappas just ahead and at the same time is worried by everyone behind him. Fittipaldi, Moore, Vassar, Tracy, and Michael Andretti. We'll be back after this message and a word from your ABC station. Today's first Toyota Spotlight focuses on the rich racing history here in Southern California. From 75 to 83, Long Beach played host to the Formula 5000 and then Formula One. World famous drivers like Nelson Piquet and Nicky Lauda, and of course, Mario Andretti, all have stood atop the podium for the Toyota Grand Prix of Long Beach. Shigeaki Hattori into the barrier, way, way too perilous a position. They've just waved the twin flags at the start-finish line and raised yellow all around the course. That, of course, means that the Toyota pace car will come out. The field will flow, and it is just the right time for pit stops as Tony Kanaan, the leader of the race, was the first to lead the field down in. Here he comes, Gary. And in fact, he'll be headed way down to the far end of the pits. Nice we look for Dario Franchitti. Franchitti in second place gets to his pit box first. Now we'll check and watch them. Everything routine. And let's check with Jan on our progress for Kanaan. Well, Kanaan is already underway, Gary, and I can hear that Dario Franchitti was leaving. Just and left. And he is long gone. Tony Kanaan, a very, very quick stop. So Tony Kanaan on the pit road. You expect the entire field to come in. This is occurring on the 24th of 85 laps. There's Jill DeFerrin in. He had a good run going, made a nice, nice move on Max Pappas and picked up a position over in nine. Has to wait for traffic to clear, and now he's away. This is where the teamwork aspect really plays into it, Paul, because if you can't get him on the track, your team go, go, can go, get go. you past him in the pits. We hear Ed Deathman encouraging Michael to get out of the pits. There's a traffic jam down there, and it's not a very wide pit lane at all. Again, you're using... Oh, you saw how close that was. <laughs> City streets here. And when they do that, they're limited by the structure of the street. And the pits here are very, very narrow, as Michael has found out on more than one occasion. So now they all come back out. Again, full course yellow. They'll line up behind the Solera pace car. And while we were away, too, not only was it a good move by, by DeFerrin, Montoya was able to move around Herta. Pit stops will change all of that. And Tarso Marquez had a quick little spin. As we join you, the green flag flies over shoulder line on the Toyota Grand Prix at Long Beach. Tony Kanaan retains his lead after a great stop. Dario Franchitti remains in second. Montoya. Exactly where he came into the pit, sitting in third, followed by Herta, Fernandez, DeFerrin, Pappas, Fittipaldi, Vassar, and Michael Andretti. In that mix, we saw Mark Lindell. He's a lap down from coming in for that earlier stop, so he's out of sequence. Oh, it's got Pruitt sideways in the corner, and Marquez, he got part of that action, and the right front is badly damaged. Lone Penske car in the field. Al Hunter Jr., by the way, is here at the track on crutches, but he says, guys, I will be back at Nazareth. Full course yellow once again because of this situation. Just yank on that. It'll come out of there. Here's what happened, Parker. Holy moly, Paul. Scott was trying to go down the inside of, uh, it looks like the car, uh, it's hard to see there, but it looks like Tarso Marquez didn't anticipate. You gotta slow down when you're side by side going into the corner. We'll look at it from this angle, Paul. Oh yeah, you can see he just speared him coming down the inside. He was trying to grow around the uh, the inside of Elio Castroneves there. And Tarso just came in way hot, locked him up offline. There's no grip there. A lot of rubber already being thrown off the outside in the marbles and just speared the back of Pruitt, turned him around, and that's the end of their day. And we're going to take a hard look at Elio Castroneves' car as well because he did get some contact on that one. We are back through the, uh, through the uh, second yellow of the day. So now... Let's send you to our wide world of sports studio in New York and Robin Robbins. The look down on the Toyota Grand Prix of Long Beach, these aerial pictures, courtesy of the Goodyear Blimp Eagle, based not far away in Carson, California. Goodyear recently increased its blimp fleet to six, adding two airships in Europe and one in South America. And there she floats over the track. Now, next Sunday, more motorsports, uh, not only Winston Cup, but I'll be in Indianapolis, Indiana for Pace Supercross at the five-time and defending champion Jeremy McGrath is closing, yes, on his sixth championship. We will have the coverage. Now, I know sometimes it gets a little frustrating as we're told that it's one lap back to green. 
couple of things that happened as we show you the field summary. A couple of things that have happened during that last little flurry of action. Michael Andretti passed Jimmy Vassar for ninth, and Paul Tracy got around Greg Moore for 11th place. And, you know, it gets frustrating from time to time with just as you go to commercial, we sit in the booth and say, oh, look at that happen. Here's the good news of that. Last 12 to 15 laps of this race, thanks to Toyota, we're going to be able to bring you, given the yellows, commercial free. And that should make for a great end of the race. We certainly hope so. So still with uh, the last lap now, before they go back to race speed, we send you to the pits again in Jan Bikas. Well, not to date you, Paul, on the leader and what took place during that pit stop is that they made no changes, spoke with the McDonald's drive through crew, and they said, we made no changes for Tony Kanaan, but we are, however, still concerned about tire wear. This played into their strategy. They wanted to stop twice anyway. Gary? We were checking with tire wear for Dario Franchitti, and Kim Green told us the tire wear was just about what we expected. Now, I can't define exactly what they expected. We had a look at the tires when it came off, and to our view, it looked like it was in pretty good shape. So at this point, we tried to check with a couple of the Firestone engineers to learn more about what happened with the Pac West situation. We know there was contact for Guzman that may have contributed to his rear tire going down. Not sure about the Blundell situation. They've referred us to Al Spire. We've yet to find Al. I know he's up and down pit road somewhere. When we encounter him, we'll try to get more information. And one of the founders of this great event was Dan Gurney, along with Chris Pook, who had the idea to race in the streets. Alex Barron, Dan Gurney's driver here, started 22nd, now runs in 13th. Couple of onboards once again for you. There's the third place car. Juan Montoya, you can hear him spinning those tires in anticipation of the restart, making sure he's got plenty of heat in him. Mike Landretti working his tires. We were able to eavesdrop on a conversation between Tony Kanon and his team owner, Steve Horn. Tony said his brakes were getting a little soft, but he didn't think it was a problem. Now, as the green comes out once again on the 31st of 85 laps, Tony Kanon still the leader. Frankiti second place. There's Frankiti. Come on, take a look at Montoya. Montoya to the inside. Well, lets the back end go, catches it. And no fear, poster oh. child at it again, Paul. This kid has nerves of steel. Nothing intimidates him. Looking back for Montoya and Frankiti through the complex. You can hear him working that Honda engine in the lower RPM band in second gear. We'll hear him short shift up to third. Up to 15,000 RPM down the back straightaway. Now coming off of Seaside into turn nine, Montoya begins to work on the leader, Tony Kanan. Talk about the great new faces in this sport. There are two of them right there. Last year's Rookie of the Year in Kanan. Montoya, brand new to the sport. What's really amazing, he's never driven this track at all. There's no practice here. He just came here and instantly was fast. Like you said, there's no testing. It didn't seem to bother him at all. He just rolled the car out and stood on it. Significantly, we've had a battle of the power plant this year with the Toyotas making great improvements. But for the first time, all six Hondas qualified in the top ten. And we're seeing Kanan, Montoya, and Franchitti, three Honda-powered cars, leading this race. Mark Blundell, of course, who has had his problems. Let's check the Circuit City telemetry on his car. Mercedes power. Raynard chassis of Mark Blundell. Currently runs 18. The thing to note, we talked about it a little bit earlier on when we were on board with Richie Hearn, is look how fast it accelerates. It'll go right off the top of the chart here, Paul, as they get down towards the end, right at 180 miles an hour. This is the slower of the two straightaways. The end of shoreline, they'll have had this graph pegged down into turn one. You know, it's impressive to me. It's certainly the acceleration is, but going from 180 down to 75, losing 100 miles an hour in just a couple hundred yards, and then making what is a normal right-hand turn on a city street. Back to the front, Montoya closes on Tony Kanan. Those are the numbers last lap around. In this situation, I think it's always better to be the hunter than the hunted. And right now, Montoya wants nothing more than to work his way up to and past Tony Kanon. Tony, Tony, of course, can only look rearward, trying to drive as cleanly and as neatly as possible, minimize any mistakes, taking as good of care of those Firestone tires as possible. Word from the order, uh, the observers on the course, Garcia is off course once again, but no factor. Run through the teams for you. Reminder of who is with which team. 
Look how strong Tony is going down that back straightaway, Paul. He's coming onto the old complex, that turn six, seven area, and able to extend his small marginal lead going down that straightaway, but we see Montoya much quicker in the new section of the course. Now keep in mind, there's a time compression element here. When they get in the slow corners, it always look like Juan catches them. Oh! Oh, and there's Alex Barron, who was doing so well. Got such a great run going. We just mentioned that he moved up to 13. I don't see any damage. If they can get him out of there, maybe they can get him going, but look at that left front tire. You want to speculate on that? Well, actually, you can see the graining there on both of those Goodyear tires on the front, Paul. Lots of graining. You can see it there. You can see the lines as we look at the left front visible there. You can see where he spun into the tires. Cart safety crew there. And I tell you, there's no other time in the world that goes by as slowly as sitting and waiting, trying to get the car back on track and refire, trying not to lose a lap to the leaders. Look at this battle though for the lead now. Three together. Kanan, Montoya, Franchitti. A mere one second, not even that, separates the nose of the lead car from the back of the third place. Well, we've seen fireworks with Montoya before in the Celebrity Deathmatch 2000 grudge that happened between he and Michael at, at Montegi. We're wondering now what Tony's thinking about having the young Colombian behind him. And Dario, I don't know if he's just sitting back just enough to get out of the carnage in case it happens or if he's pushing as hard as he can. You know, you always hear the Wiley veterans sitting back. That's usually nonsense, Paul. The drivers are normally driving absolutely as hard as they can. But he seems to be breathing just a little bit behind Montoya there. Oh, man, I like that Wiley veteran story. But I'll tell you, you saw the... Look at it here. There it is. Montoya is faster. And he certainly closed the gap to get here. I mean, did it quick. Well, in that last lap, Montoya and Franchitti's lap times were separated by one hundredth of a second. On board with Montoya now. We're just going to ride with him here as he chases Kanan down. Thirty miles an hour. Up through the gears. Max in the Honda out just over 15,000 RPM. Hard on the brakes, all the way down to second in that sequential box. He just pushes the lever forward to go down. Rejoins the old circuit here, Paul. And keep in mind, this onboard camera is higher so you can see where you're going from Juan's perspective. He's down in a tunnel. He can't see through these corners like our onboard camera can. Montoya not going to catch him here. The Matic at the front remains the same. Jan Bikas. Tarso Marquez has made his way back to pit road. Tarso, we saw you got in trouble in turn one. What happened? Uh -huh. A lot of problems. Unfortunately, we, could, we are out of the race. My car was very good, much better than during the practice. I tried to, to overtake Robbie Gordon. He was closing the door too much, and he didn't choose just one line in the straight line. So he pushed me too much inside to the brake, and I break on third party. And unfortunately, I missed the brake a little bit, and I I pushed through it as well, and I lost my front wheel. And I know not the way that Tarso Marquez wanted this one to end, Paul. And uh, you wonder what Penske's thinking about the decision to go with the single car. So it's Kanan, Montoya, Franchitti. They remain spaced the same, covered by a blanket. We'll be back after this message and a word from your ABC station. Our Toyota Spotlight continues its focus on the history of this great event. In 84, Mario Andretti claimed his second victory on the streets of Long Beach, but the circuit now belonged to Champ Car. Andretti and his son Michael claimed four victories together before passing the crown to Al Unter Jr., who won six different events. But in today's 25th anniversary race, only Jimmy Vassar, Paul Tracy, and Michael Andretti have seen the checkered flag. 
22nd. These cars will head off back to the ovals to Nazareth, Pennsylvania. Of course, we'll have coverage on Kart Today on ESPN2. If you haven't seen that, that'll get you up to speed for the race itself. And then the Kart Nazareth 200 on ESPN. Nothing's changed in that battle for the front. It continues to roll onward. These three cars of Kanan, Montoya, and Franchitti, Paul, are the three fastest cars on the track by almost a second. But significantly, as we've been watching, Kanan and Montoya are using their rear tires. You can see them sliding the cars, both coming into the corners and coming off the corners, while Dario Franchitti, very neat and tidy, conserving his tires, still able to run the pace, but I think getting much better tire wear. Jan Vickers. Patrick Carpante has brought his car into the pits. They're going to go for a four-tire change. Remember, he is out of sequence because he had an incident. I saw a half turn on the front wing. That's the only change they made. Taking a while for fuel on that one. It was 15.1. Back up front with Montoya. You know, try this one on for size. These three cars have had, among their drivers, 62 starts. By comparison, Michael Andretti, who won his first race here, and who's looking pretty good now, 233 starts. Boy, there's the changing face of Jam Car Racing. It really is, but it shows you that there is a movement towards youth in the kart ranks, and we see these three young drivers, three very, very young, talented men that can get it done not only on ovals, but also on road courses and temporary street courses. Alex Barron, by the way, did make it back to the pits and was able to keep in the fight. Last few laps, Christian Fittipaldi, Michael Andretti, able to move their way past Pappas and catch up to DeFerrin. Now, Fittipaldi is seventh, Andretti is eighth. This, though, is still the focus. It's interesting, Paul, the last few laps, both Tony and Juan have started to clean up their act a little bit. They're not pushing quite as hard, even though their lap times are still very, very fast. Their cars are much more orderly. You don't see them sliding the back of the car as much as we did when we were away. Dario Franchitti still hanging on back there, but I know, Paul, that no matter what's happening as far as lap times, Dario's got to be getting the best fuel economy of the three of them. The only thing that's saving Tony is watch how good he is coming off this hairpin down shoreline. Every single time he's able to get a good jump off of Juan Montoya, and I think that's the only thing saving him from having Juan trying to attempt an outbreaking maneuver at the end of the straightaway. Tony's very, very good getting the power down and accelerating down this long straightaway. Just past the halfway point now with 43 laps into the book. Michael Andretti now running eight. Ahead, somewhere ahead there to be Christian Fittipaldi. Uh, but a full four seconds ahead. So Michael's been coming forward around Pappas, actually around Pappas, Vassar, and Tracy to end up in eighth place. Blair sailing ahead for the former winner here. You can see how hard he's working the steering wheel there, Paul. This is much different than the ovals, where the ovals don't tax you very much physically. Even though there's a lot of lateral loads, it's very smooth. These guys are maybe pulling three and a half Gs on the circuit, but it's like having your head in a paint shaker at a hardware store. I always say the concentration level is high enough. It's like you're doing differential calculus in a sauna while you're doing a stair climber. And if you make a mistake, someone hits you in the head and takes $100,000 out of your wallet. And I tell you, to do this 85 laps in a row is very, very tough. And you actually drove on this circuit with that kind of philosophy? Oh, heck, I love this place, Paul. I only got to compete here twice. I finished second and fifth, both times racing with the king of the beach, Al Unser Jr. The only complaint I had with Al, oh, we saw Christian having to look down to Farron, was, gee, Al, I love racing with you. Can it be for the win sometime? And, and Al thought that was a good idea. We're going through the uh, different manufacturers for you, engines and chassis. Interesting, three Swifts now run in the top eight. Let's go to Jan Vegas. Well, we talked about tires, and we even mentioned Al Spire. Here he is. He's a director of racing for Firestone. I know you're a little concerned coming in, and now some of the tires are showing big wear. Well, we've had some wear, but we've also had what we believe are a couple punctures, and we're watching the rear tire pressure as well. But uh, the longer they run green, uh, wear has been relatively high, but we're not concerned. And certainly some of the fastest cars, like Tony Kanaan and Dario Franchitti, they seem to be doing just fine. Okay, now, will it help you if they stay green and it stays hot, or is it, what's the best scenario for you? 
We don't think it really matters. Uh, if it stays green, that's fine. Our tires have a great reputation for durability and consistency. And if they come in and change it, but on new ones, that's just as well with us as same thing. All right, thank you, Al. Let's get to Gary Darrell. At the other end of the pitch, you on a quick update on Max Pappas. He's been sliding back. He's in the ninth spot, and sliding is the word. Oh, oh no! The leader of the race, Tony Kanan, off head on into the barrier. Okay, we see it, Tony. Sorry, buddy. Nice job, anyway. That That's was it. that was Steve Horn, team manager now there, talking to Tony Kanan, saying we see it on the TV. Oh, no. This is in turn six, Paul. The officials were looking at this section after the support races had run. There were a lot of marbles. We heard some complaints. There you can see the surface oh boy. very much coming up. And when you're trying to put 900 horsepower down to the ground, this is exactly what you don't need. But I have to compliment Steve Horn. What a gentleman. Yep. He's brought Tony Kanaan along through the Indy Light Series where they won the championship. And there all you heard were pat on the backs and kudos. He knows he's got a brilliant young talent in his hands. And there he's building up ready to get on to the next race. And what, a, what, a, what a shame for this team, but they've done such a great job this weekend. And so now you ride with the new leader of the race. There's Steve Horn, the fellow we were talking about. He and his wife, Christine, have been heavily into this sport all of their lives. And there's Chip Ganassi. He knows his guy, Juan Montoya, is in first place and about to see a full course yellow ahead of him. Tony Kanan, that is a very long walk. There's Montoya. John Bikas. Well, you just saw Steve Horn. Let's talk to him. He had a great run going. Any idea why he got wide there in that corner? Uh, no idea, really. Yarn. The car was working fine. He was very comfortable. I noticed on the TV the track started to break up a little bit there, so maybe that pulled him out. But otherwise, I don't know. Up until that point, were you still very concerned about tire wear? Uh, not really. The tires were working perfectly. Um, you know, they were at their limit, but uh, that's what we expect from tires done. And, uh, no, the tires were fine. Thanks, Steve. Let's get to Gary. Boy, I tell you what, Jan, while you were talking to Steve Horn, the leader Montoya came in here for routine service, and they got him out of here in great fashion. Terrific stop for Montoya. You can hear Chip Ganassi telling Juan Montoya to go to position one. That's the fuel controller that leans it out. You can hear him say to lean the fuel out there. They're trying to get the maximum amount of mileage. So Montoya assumes the lead of the race, followed out of the pits by Frank Keaty as we are under a full course yellow. Full course yellow, that's Paul Tracy, obviously not in his race car. As he came out of the pits, just as we were going to commercial, he got together with several other drivers. We think Pappas, we think Michael, but certainly he is out of the race. Now the full course yellow, you saw it for the car of Tony Kanan, who was the leader of the race at the time. And Parker, maybe we can figure out what happened to the leader. We think that turn might have been part of the problem. This is Juan Montoya's view of the leader up in front of him, Tony Kanan. They're just now transitioning from turn five back to turn six where they rejoin the old circuit. You can see there, Tony's way wide, Paul. He just missed the turn in for turn number six. And I tell you, if you get a car width out of the groove, there's enough rubber offline. The car has no grip. It's like hitting gravel, like hitting ice, and the car went right into the tires. What a shame. Now, Tony Kanan, the pole sitter and the leader of the race, right to that point, ends up into the barrier and out of the run. I mentioned earlier how important the concentration was. There's no other sport that it takes this much concentration all the time. There are no breaks, no huddles, no coming back for points. And if you make a small mistake, that's what happens. All right, maybe we can clarify that pit situation, Gary. Paul Tracy out of the car, as you mentioned, Paul. Can you tell us what happened? And I, we didn't see it here on pit road as you exited. Yeah, I got a couple guys on the stop and I was going down the pit lane and uh, another car, I think it was Michael, swung out in front of me and just swung right over into me and threw my car in the air. Pretty similar to what happened to him and him and Emmo a few years ago and just, you know, bent the rear suspension and you can't really fix it at any time. So it's Los Angeles traffic jam in the pit lane. Thank you. <laughs> Good for Paul Tracy. He could keep a sense of humor as he climbs out of the car in one of the most important events of the year. So now here is the change in the order. It might be a long yellow, though. Nothing has changed, still under full course yellow, looking down on the course of the Toyota Grand Prix of Long Beach from the Goodyear Blimp Eagle, who has been providing these aerial pictures at the control is 
pilot Nick Nicolari. 1999, the 101st anniversary of Goodyear and the 74th for its blimp fleet. Now in one week, ABC Sports will head off to Talladega, Alabama for the Touchstone Energy 300. That's Saturday Live at 3.30 Eastern. Let's get updated on how we play to the end of this race. Start with Gary Gerald. And with Rob Hill, who of course is on the radio with Juan Montoya. That was a terrific stop when you came in here. The question is, do you think you got enough fuel on this stop that you can go to the distance to the checker? Well, you know, with all kinds of racing, it depends how the yellows fall. If this yellow stays good for a couple more laps, I think we can make it to the end. Tell us about the development of this 23-year-old driver who's so spectacular now leading the race. I beg your pardon? Tell us about the development of Montoya leading this race now at age 23. He's going to be a champion. He is phenomenal as a race car driver. Uh, I didn't think anyone would be able to step up like Alex was, uh, but this guy's going to be great. Glowing endorsement. Let's check in with Jan Bikas. And let's check in on the situation for Adrian Fernandez. The last race, everyone said, no, you can't make it to the end on fuel. Here we are again. Adrian Fernandez now in third spot. Can you make it to the end on that much fuel? Well, that's going to be a tight one, Jan. I mean, we're almost in the same position we were in last race. So it's going to be a gamble at the end. It depends on if we have another yellow or not. And uh, it's going to be real tight. If I hear we're going green now, so you'll need one more yellow. At least one more yellow. All right, thanks, Steve. Well, Adrian Fernandez, there he is, fourth place. Right. We're following Chess Richie Hearn, by the way. The last possible minute and use the button. The chess game unfolds. We heard there what he's doing is he's keeping it on the leanest fuel selection they have, which gets him roughly eight to ten miles per gallon. What was Juan was told there is once it goes green, to Play hit the out. button. That'll you put it on full power right so now. he can so that he can get back up to speed and put a break between him and Dario. There's no question Juan's very quick, Paul. Dario's the best in the business on going the fastest on the least amount of fuel. I want to mention Richie Hearn. He's, despite all of his problems, now in the points, sitting in 12th place. The race recap after 51 laps. The hairpin is ahead for Montoya. The green flag should come shortly thereafter. Keep an eye on Frankiti in second place. Well, for that matter, Frankini heard of Fernandez and Fittipaldi. He snookered him, Paul. He absolutely snookered Dario Frankini. Unbelievable. Look at the lead that he's pulled out. I am very surprised that he was able to take advantage of Dario Frankini like that through the back section. He was going very, very slowly, got on the button and stood on it. Here comes Herta, tries to move for second place, comes to the outside. Not the ideal passing position, but he certainly let him know he was there and a touch bit faster. Frankini holds off Herta. There's Fernandez, there's Fittipaldi just behind him. Montoya drove away from everybody, hammered the throttle right off of the hairpin. It's deja vu all over again, Paul, from last year. We've got a green car, the shell car, and we've got one of the target cars in the top three. And you know, Paul, this just isn't the Long Beach Grand Prix, the race. This is an event. I know every North American road racer, including myself, grew up dreaming of winning two races when you finally became a professional. One was a cart 500 miler, the other was the Long Beach Grand Prix. This means a lot, not only now to North American road racers, but it's got a reputation worldwide. What a way for Juan Montoya to get his young road racing career to a start in kart racing. Third time in the season he's led, now a full lap under green and disappearing for the field as they came across the line at the conclusion of that last lap, the 53rd. He had 2.2 seconds on second place for Ankiti. I never would have guessed that would have happened. That was a real surprise. I mean, that's really heads up for a 23-year-old and only his third start. And it was beautifully done. But this is really becoming a chess game, Paul. How fast can you go on how little fuel? When it comes down to really one lap. It's the way I'm calculating it. Thank goodness I'm not sitting on a scoring stand trying to figure that out because it drives me nuts. I mean, if something's going to happen in the last two laps of the race. And again, final laps of the race, we're going to try to give you totally commercial free. Thank you to Toyota for making that available to us. And I tell you, there are a group of data acquisition guys down in the pits that are recalculating and recalculating and confirming and recalculating along with the engineers on the engines to try to see if they can actually get to the finish line. Max Pappas with Jimmy Vassar working on him.
That's her course, former series champion from up in the Bay Area. Is one of those guys, in fact, that uh, also grew up dreaming of this race. Boy, did you see oh. PJ gets in trouble. It looks like he got nailed by one of the players' cars there, Paul. And that would have to be Greg Moore. Uh, PJ, who had a good run going, working his way up. It's a little wide on the corner, gets tapped, wants to get going. Son of the great Parnelli Jones. PJ trying to go down the inside of Greg Moore there. It was four position, never got tapped by Greg Moore. I take it back and, and apologies to Greg. He just got in hot offline. It's very slick, locked up the rears, ran out of space and into the tires he went, Paul. So PJ, Pat Patrick, his car owner looks on. And PJ frustrated wants the crews out there to get him rolling as soon as he can. But again, it creates a full course yellow, our fourth full course yellow of the day. Montoya leads. Our Toyota spotlight is on the stars who were out in full force yesterday at Long Beach to take in the atmosphere and participate in the Toyota Pro Celebrity Race. Early on, the racing was tight. But then the action heated up when Andy Lauer got his car spun from behind and went sliding into the wall. Then Donnie Osmond got involved, flipping his car. Fortunately, he walked away unharmed. Rapper Coolio showed his skills behind the wheel. But Roger Mears, as one of the pros, was able to sneak by him, move through the field. When the dust cleared, Sean Palmer of X Games fame took the checkered flag and celebrated his victory on the podium with the pro champion, Roger Mears. Well, we're still under that full course yellow, but Parker Johnstone, the end game is going to be awfully neat. Well, this changed it from a chess game to a WWO match because now no holds barred. These guys are going to full rich, full power. We'll see what they've got, Paul. 28 laps remaining as we come back to green. We will bring you the last 15 laps of this race commercial free. Juan Montoya chased by Frankini again. He comes off the corner, nails it. Frankini can only chase, but Herta moves up on Frankini. Here comes Fernandez and Fittipaldi as well. Michael Andretti moves on to Farron, gets him. Whoa, nice move. Boy, Michael just went down the inside, stood on the brakes and hoped for an opening. That was brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. We saw in the restart there that Juan was unable to take advantage of Dario like he had before. But we saw Brian very strong on the last restart. We'll see if Dario now uh, is able Robbie, to get back up on one. Robbie Gordon off again. Now this time he can come around and join the track. There he goes. That's a little cut through they built, but he can't improve his time. A lot of the guys were saying, well, hey, if you have a big blockage in the first turn, can I just use that and say make up a lap? Answer was no. You may not. Chief Stuart Wally Dallenbach just laughed in the driver's meeting when they asked that. But there are the drivers always looking for the advantage. Boy, look at that interval. Though still, Frankiti is in the fight. Cristiano DeMata runs 17th down a lap. He comes on the shoreline now. You know, it's amazing, Paul, is right now Montoya and Frankiti are running two seconds a lap quicker than Brian Herta or anyone else in the field. A full two seconds. That is flat amazing with only 27 laps to go. That they're able to push that hard and no one's able to respond. But it's not just raw speed that's going to pay off here. Can you get to the end of the race without stopping again? Will you have to go lean, slow the car down? All those are going to be factors. And they're factors, interestingly enough, that are new factors to Montoya. He never had to deal with this in his career in Formula 5000. And when he was a test driver for Formula One, obviously it never came up. But there is a lot going on in these cars, Paul. We talked about how busy they are just driving, but all the time you're changing boost, mixture settings, sway bars. It's a very, very busy office. These guys, without doubt, are well-conditioned athletes, but they also have to think on a conscious level, as well as being in the zone, making adjustments to their cars, talking to their, their team managers and mechanics so that they get the best out of the equipment while hustling these cars through concrete walls at 180 miles an hour. Oh, and just a couple of other factors. They just came off of two oval races, now on a temporary street circuit, back to an oval. You want to talk about the definition of versatile? There it is, Circuit City. 
telemetry from the car. This one will show not only the miles an hour, but lateral G forces for Richie Hearn, currently in 11. Fell back, remember he had the banner on the right side of his car, lost his right mirror. Something they don't fix on a pit stop. He's trailing Mauricio Gugelin here in the Mercedes powered radar of Pac West. So Richie Hearn continues on. So does Montoya, Franchitti, Herta, Fernandez, and Fittipaldi. They are at the top of the field. So now we continue to watch that game play to the end. We'll be back after this message and a word from your ABC station. All page with Parker Johnstone back at the Toyota Grand Prix of Long Beach, the silver anniversary. Bobby Labonte, the defending champion, yep, not here. It's NASCAR on ABC. The Die Hard 500 from Talladega next Sunday live at 1 o'clock Eastern. Here are the current standings for you as you ride with Juan Montoya leading this race and only his third start. 3.5. Sixty-three laps complete. Twenty-two remain. A brilliant run by the young Colombian Paul right now. He's turning laps almost a half a second quicker than Frank Keaty, who's another half a second quicker than Herta, who's quicker than the rest of the field. So he's continuing Juan Montoya's to extend his lead here and doing so so well yeah, like you know, he's been doing this all his life and Dario Franchitti who normally is this cool collected guy he's desperate out there right now we've seen him make some uncharacteristic mistakes he's usually so cool so collected while we were away he was locking wheels he's hustling this car harder at least from the outside that we've seen him hustle it in a long time he's usually so silky smooth you can tell he's working extremely hard he certainly hasn't given up and settled for second here even though montoya is now continuing to pull out his lead to almost four and a half seconds upper left will run through the teams for you again there's the interval from first to second only uh, castro nevis separating them remember he was involved in that incident a little earlier so he's sitting back on board michael andretti he's on shoreline andretti currently is sixth place his uh teammate at Newman Haas Racing, Christian Fittipaldi, is in fifth, though not immediately ahead of him. There's about two seconds between this car and Christian. There's Christian right now. And Christian, fortunately, is not in any way locked in a battle that, that matters for position with him. Now, Tony Kanan finally out of the uh, CART Medical Center with Gary Gerald. Tony, uh, I know this has to be very, very disappointing. Tell us what happened. Well, I was trying too hard to pull it away from uh, Juan, and uh, fortunately I put one wheel and, uh, and the rubber, and the car just slides, it and it was too much, and I, I hit the wall, uh, the tire barrier. But, uh, I mean, my drive to crew did a great job. Steve and all these guys are great. And fortunately, you know, I really hate when I made a mistake, and this happened today, but I think we did, uh, we proved to ourselves that we have a, a very good car and we can do it, so... It's not going to happen anymore. It happens just once. Let's get a quick word with Steve Horn. Steve, you've seen this young man develop his career. Do you have to do cheerleading in this situation, or do you worry at all about what impact this might have? Well, I just said, Tony, when you get to my age, you can always think of wor things worse than this. And uh, anybody out there remember Indy 95? That was a little worse than this. <laughs> <laughs> yes, indeed. All right, Jan Bikas. Well, in regards to Adrian Fernandez, remember we spoke with his crew and they said they needed more yellow. Well, the answer to the question is they got enough yellow. He has plenty of fuel to make it to the end. And I assume that would mean all the front runners do. And that assumption, of course, is made. And, and I got to tell you, generally the pit guys are very, very straight up with our pit reporters. Occasionally when the press gets very tight, you know, maybe they, they'll fudge a lap or two. But so that's the assumption. We race all the way to the finish. I think the gloves are off, Paul. I think these guys are driving absolutely as hard as they can. And remember, in Long Beach as a past, there have been some pretty spectacular things that have happened in the closing lap. So it's not done by any means as of yet. Adrian Fernandez, the 40 Takati car, stable of Pat Patrick, last week's winner in Motegi, Japan. 13 seconds behind the lead, currently runs in fourth base. Brian Herta is his target. Christian Fittipaldi will be searching for him back to the front of the field. Juan Montoya, the leader. 
his third race. Driving for Chip Ganassi at target Chip Ganassi. His teammate Jimmy Vasser is sitting back in ninth place right now, just ahead of Greg Moore. And Paul, as we watch this car, you can see how well balanced it was. I mean, he just slid the car right out to the wall, but well in control, not overdriving, and he's continued, continuing to extend his lead. He's now pulled out another second on Dyer Franchitti. It's up to 5.4 seconds, but you can tell he's driving well within his limits. The car isn't moving under braking, or as he turns in, puts the power down. It's all very smooth, very collected. I think now he's just trying to make sure that at this pace he can stay in his rhythm, stay focused, and get through the last 18 laps to the checkered flag. Now, and let us do remember, as we go to the closing lap, twice in the last three years, the winner of this race has only led four laps or less. We'll be back commercial three right after this. of Long Beach. Now the entire remainder of the race would be brought to you without commercial interruption by Toyota. Boy, we've been trying to get sponsors to step up to this plate for years. Thank you, Toyota. As a race fan, I know that makes a world of difference at the closing stages of the race. Thanks, Toyota. Montoya is the leader by seven seconds over Dario Franchitti, Brian Herta, and Adrian Fernandez. Christian Fittipaldi sits in fifth. There are your current standings. And we're going to take him back in the field since this lead is so broad but once again remember anything that wall can reach out and snatch you at any second at this track Michael Andretti with Jill DeFerrin all over his back door and Pappas all over DeFerrin and then Jimmy Vassar just sitting there the best seat in the house for that battle now up ahead of them Paul is a lap car of Patrick Carpentier and then Michael's teammate Christian Fittipaldi but it's obvious now the deferent, as we saw earlier, is quicker than Michael. Michael was actually getting away a little earlier, but now he's fallen back into the clutches of Deferrin. Once Deferrin is able to figure out a way how to get around Michael, and I say if, because that is very, very difficult to do, I expect he'll pull away. But we can see that right now, Michael's holding station. Also watching DeFerrin is John Vikas. Yes, and I spoke with Derek Walker, the team owner, and he said right now we can run faster than the other guys, but traffic is the problem. Because there's so much rubber that's on the racetrack, you don't dare step out of line to try and make a move. You have to wait for a mistake for the guys ahead. Paul? Gary Gerald. Quick update on Juan Montoya as he continues to stretch the lead. The 23-year-old rookie is just amazing. And remember, Chip Ganassi and his team are looking for their fourth straight win here at the beach. And they now have the luxury of knowing that even at the pace they're running, they should have two gallons of fuel left when he gets to the checkered flag. All he's got to do now is go mistake-free over these final 15 laps. No small feat here as well. That sounds easy, Paul, but I tell you, it's hot. It takes a lot of concentration. If you've got a lead like Montoya does, it's easy to fall out of rhythm, and it takes just the smallest mistake of even a quarter of an inch, and you're out of the race. Now, when we were on board with Jill DeFerrin, we saw some smoke coming out of the back of Michael's car. That was simply brake lockup. Michael is pushing this car as hard as we can, and as we watch, Jill DeFerrin trying to force Michael into a mistake there, Paul. In fact, we're going to stay on board with DeFerrin here. Michael just ahead. This is the best battle on the circuit. It is a fight for sixth. Listening to the radio, listen to the gears. This series is Paul. We've got a Renard Honda Goodyear shot car chasing down a Swift Ford Firestone car, and they are just locked in this battle. The problem is, how does Jill get around him now that he's caught him? Hairpin ahead. Let's look at that battle from the blimp. DeFerrin comes to the inside. Drag race down the straightaway. Michael gets a little better off the corner, but DeFerrin's right there. Now the tell will come at turn number one. You can see that Jill turn in later. He's got a draft. He's trying to use that to his advantage. 
DeFerrin locking up that right front, trying to get down on the inside of Michael, Paul. And Pappas was able to close in on this one. Look at that three-way fight now. Back with DeFerrin. Michael and Paul, or Michael and Jill are using up their tires at a heavy rate now, which will favor Max. We can see on that last lap that DeFerrin was a few tenths quicker than Michael, but catching him's one thing, getting around him is something completely different. He's trying to set him up, trying to work the mirrors, Paul. What I mean by that, he's looking down the inside, looking down the outside to try to distract Michael from the task of driving the car and looking ahead. And, and look up there behind Pappas, that's Moore now, who was able to get around Vassar. And did it on that back to straight away as well. Oh, what a good fight this is. T.J. Jones back in the action after his incident earlier. Okay, feels okay. 11 laps remaining. Update on Greg Moore now. Yes, what Greg Moore has been instructed to do, Paul, is to use the button as much as he can, including coming off of the corners. They know they have enough fuel. They keep saying, use the button, use the button to give them just that little more turbo boost. Once again, Paul, that resets the fuel to maximum power, advances the ignition timing, and what it allows them to do is get everything they can out of their engine, but they have a maximum number of times that they can use the button or a maximum amount of seconds that they can use it. As long as they're full throttle, and remember, as they're upshifting, they're full throttle the whole time, just pulling up through the gears, the electronics automatically cut out and refire the, the engine at exactly the right time as they're shifting up through those gears. And the first time they lift off the throttle, then that button is disengaged and it goes back to whatever power setting they've got on their fuel dial. But some of the systems will allow just continuous full power, but it puts a real strain on the engine because at some point you run out of maximum power and it all falls out of the back of the car quite spectacularly sometimes. Benipaldi still traced by, traced by DeFerrin, 75 laps complete, 10 to go. Thanks to Toyota, we are commercial free through the end of the run here. Montoya is still the leader, driving for target Chip Ganassi, followed by Franchitti, but not closely. Franchitti is nine seconds back, and nine seconds further back is Brian Herta. This is where the fight seems to be. Michael Andretti, there you see him. Just ahead of DeFerrin now. So that whole battle closes down. DeFerrin first raced here in 1995. He's led 56% of all the laps he's ever turned at Long Beach. Here comes DeFerrin moving on him. Now, nope. started out, took a look, can't do it. And this is the first time, Paul, he hasn't led a lap here. This place owes Jill DeFerrin. He may not get the win, but at least getting around Michael Andretti would be some satisfaction considering how hard this team has worked developing this Goodyear tire package. Jill right behind him. Comparison in tires here. Now we know that Jill's Goodyears are much, much harder, but given the hot day and the long race, is there an advantage perhaps now? Well, the Firestones have always liked hot conditions, something that traditionally the Goodyears haven't. So even though the Ferret's tires are a little bit more conservative, a little harder in compound, I think right now that Michael's Firestones may be working well, but the problem is DeFerrin's quicker in all the places that Michael isn't, but he can't use it to his advantage, where Michael's much quicker, as we saw much earlier in the race, is coming off the hairpin down Shoreline Drive, and DeFerrin can't get a run on him to try to outbreak him down to the inside. Where DeFerrin's quicker, he can't pass. Oh, no, and this may change the entire complexion of the race. Looks like Mark Blundell from the colors, Paul. I'm not sure, but it looks like the Motorola-sponsored Pack West car. But if they go full course yellow, which I would think they would be inclined oh, no, to do. no, it's not. It's Cristiano, Cristiano DiMato. Cristiano DiMato. And the, the yellows come out. We go to full course yellow. We'll slow the race. The field will pack up on Montoya with five laps to go. Well, that's what I get. I finally stick my neck out and try to guess the car, and I got it wrong. Unfortunately, Cristiano DiMatteo was the highest qualifying Toyota. His day's done in the tires. And I, I don't want to. I don't want to get you wrong. My guess is we got eight to go right now. My guess is by the time they cycle everything, it'll probably be five, maybe even only four to go. This is the fifth yellow of the race. Here is Cristiano DiMatteo on board, coming through turn six. Oh, Paul. That is the same place that Tony Kanan got into the tires. You can see he missed the apex by probably no more than about a foot. And that's all it took. 
Now that's the same place where we saw earlier that the track is coming apart and Cristiano, unlike Tony, you can see his skid marks just lower to the right there. Cristiano missed it by inches, Paul, just merely inches. That's all it took to put that MCI World Comp car into the tires. You know what I like to see there too, is the course marshal immediately jump to the fence to climb up on it to look to make sure he's okay. They are all volunteers here, except, of course, for the car safety team and those types, but the course corner workers are volunteers. They always do a great job, and they always jump on it. Having made that point, too, we, we saw the same thing a week ago at Motegi, and we don't often see this. When we had the fire with the Pat Patrick car, Scott Pruitt, two firefighters were over that wall on top of the car. They were local firefighters, and they were right there. They weren't going to worry about traffic. They were going to worry about dealing with it. It's that kind of courage that helps us do this. you got to remember, Paul, this sport is dangerous. I mean, you can get killed doing this, and these guys are right there. Now, this is Mo Nunn, the engineer for Juan Montoya, who was so successful with Alex Zanardi, and, of course, Chip Ganassi, the team owner, looking for one of his cars to win their fourth straight Long Beach Grand Prix. And Chip Ganassi, of course, the car owner. Proud man of Pittsburgh, hoping that he can see his young driver bring it home in first. The fuel game, well, that's totally out the window now. There's no question about it whatsoever. Seven laps remain under the full course, Shelley. You know the car safety team's going to do everything they can to pull that car clear. And the field with Montoya leading it behind the Toyota Solera pace car. Franchitti is right there, and the game is to Franchitti and Herta now because this is going to be their chance. There was an interval as deep as 10 seconds from the leader back, and now they're right on top of them owing to this full course yellow. There's your full field summary. You can keep track of your driver. The focus is going to be on the front of the field, and all that we need to know now is how quickly will they be able to clear the course, restrack the barrier, and put us back into the fight? And I tell you, from Juan Montoya's perspective, Paul, as he was in the zone, there was no doubt he was pulling out a lead. He didn't care if it went green the whole way because he had everyone handled. But now, the full course yellow gives you a chance to actually think about the enormity of about what you're to accomplish, which is to win the Long Beach Grand Prix and only your third race in this series. Now. He's a steely-eyed okay, motor racer, going, this guy is, but still, I know that Chip Ganassi's talking to him, as we can hear a little bit in the background, trying to keep him calm down, trying to keep him focused, and of course, behind him, everybody's got everything to gain and almost nothing to lose. Jan Bikas. Barry Green, of course, the team owner for Dario Franchitti. We know that Montoya is fast. Do you have a shot at him? Well, I mean, you know, he's definitely fast. We were trying to make sure that we didn't over abuse the tires. The tires have been great all day. We wanted to keep and run, uh, run a consistent pace. He's very fast. This certainly closes up the gap, so at least it gives another shot at him. We'll just see how many laps we've got here. We've got to protect our back door too, though, so uh, it's going to be an exciting few, few laps here to the end. Any coaching going on? Do you tell him whether to go for it or to be conservative? Uh, i got guys uh, in Dario's pit here. They're doing a great job for me. Don Halliday, Kim, Kyle, and all the boys. Great pit stops today, so uh, I just leave it up to them. I'm just standing here sort of a little nervous. I'd like to see this one uh, in the bag. Thank you, Barry. Thank you. Let's get to Gary. Chip Ganassi, does this change it to any great degree now for you and your young driver? Not really, Gary. I think we're okay. We're plenty, plenty of fuel, and uh, we just want to play a little conservative after, after uh, last week's antics. Are you doing any cheerleading at all on the radio, or has he got everything under control in your mind? Uh, no cheerleading. It's all business yet. Does it surprise you at all that on only his third race, he's in a position where he may be able to win this? Uh, not really. I mean, the guy has a lot of talent. That's why we hired him. And I saw Morris Nunn over here immediately shaking his head. Morris, you know this kid could be a winner right off the bat, huh? Sure. No problem at all. A lot of confidence down here, but still, we got a few laps to go. Now we saw Morris done on his way out to one of the many parties because this is a festive time in Long Beach. Look at the work they're doing over in the corner. They, the whole cart of them. they want to make sure that that corner is totally ready to race. I mean, not just clear it away, but they've gone to extra lengths to make sure that it's as cleaned off as it can because that's been the critical corner. But uh, Morris was on his way to the parties, and, and Parker and I walked into the hotel lobby, and talked to him a little bit, and he said, boy, this this kid, you have no idea how good this kid really is. I was very privileged to be at his first ever test in IndyCars months ago back in Homestead, Florida on the road course, and Paul, I've never seen anyone in an initial test do a full burnout out of the pits, up onto the rev limiter, and immediately, I mean immediately, first lap, car sideways, right up to speed. I was greatly impressed, and the confidence that Chip Ganassi and Morris Nunn and that whole target crew have in him 
are paying off, Paul, because here he is leading the Long Beach Grand Prix. You may see the light still flashing on the Toyota Solara pace car. As the field, now the lights go out. Word is out, we're ready to go green. So, Paul, we haven't seen any fireworks down in that first turn at the restarts or the initial start, but I tell you now, it could be desperation time for a lot of their drivers because this could be their only chance. Can he get a jump like he did before, Paul? We'll see. Crowd jumps to its feet. They're off of the hairpin. Green, 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 green. Frankini stays there on this one. Heard it tucks in pretty well, loses some distance. Fernandez falls well back. Frankini's all over him, down to the first corner. Four laps to go. And Frankini is right there and pushing him. Hurt his clothes back in. Now remember what Barry Green said, even though we saw Dario looking, locking up his tires earlier, he said that Dario's been trying to keep good tires underneath him during this entire run. We know that Juan was pretty conservative towards the end of that last run, but now we'll see because now this whole race is up for grabs. Frankini is right there. This is one of the passing zones. He darts a little, doesn't move for it. You'll see these cars dance now, Paul. These guys are on the edge. Listen to him work the throttle. That closure came with the breaking of Montoya. Had nothing to do with Frank Keating. Montoya accelerates away. Interval at the line, nine tenths. Three to go. Keep in mind, Paul, that on those pace or on those yellow caution laps, they pick up a lot of the race rubber that's been laid down. So these first few laps, the cars are very nervous, very difficult to drive. Oh, Frank Keaty once again. Montoya, though, is the faster. Frank Keaty's really got that car darting. You're not looking at lap time. That's the speed that we see on the right there. Montoya is starting to pull away. Look at him drive that car, Paul. Oh, but so many other factors lie just offside the line of this track. Twice we've seen it today. We're just a wheel six inches off into the marbles, and you're into the barrier. Montoya for the hairpin. He's working it. Oh, what a great line. Rips right off of there. Okay, Little two slower. To go, two to go. Little slower for Franchitti. He drops back. The interval goes to 1.6. Well, we've got the three best street courses, course racers in the business here, first, second, and third with Juan Montoya. We didn't know he was one of the best in the business, but apparently he's just given notice. Dario Franchitti and Brian Herta. The great Jody Schechter used to describe a driver as driving disconnected, meaning that he was skating the car everywhere he went, but still in total control. I, I think that definition works here. When my team owners used it, it meant that my head was disconnected from the rest of my body, Paul, so. I was going to say, that, that's a whole different deal. Yes, it is. We won't go there. 11, Michelle, no deal. Michelle Jourdain Jr. stopped on the course over by 11. Shouldn't be a factor, especially since we're in the final laps. Sounded like Chip Ganassi talking to Juan Montoya. You can hear how monotone, how calm he is. Okay, one to go, one to go. White flag, white flag. Chip Ganassi calls it for you. You saw Jordan's car there at the edge. It will not be a factor in the final lap. Order remains the same. Montoya, Franchitti, Herta, Fernandez, Fittipaldi, Gilda Ferrin. If you're in this position, Paul, you're just going, come on, baby, keep running. You really want to be very clean here. You break just a tad early. Give yourself just an inch off the wall, but not too much. You can't get off the racing line. He has the time, 2.2, as they went under the white flag. Separation, Montoya to Frank Didi. Back in his pits, everybody there that's worked so hard for so long, getting these cars ready for this race after Montegi. Their hearts in their throats, fingers crossed. Oh, this kid is good. So very, very good. Juan Montoya, his third race in the series, looks for his first career win. To the 
the man. You are the man. Ah, there you heard Chip Ganass say you it. You are the man. Great job. Great job. Oh, without question, circle. the 39th winner in card history and the name. Bad guy. Is Juan Montoya as he thanks the crew. Look at that. There's a happy right guy. Remember, Juan, now for Victory Circle, you come in the back door. You come in the back door. And if Dario Franchitti comes up alongside to congratulate him, Montoya wins it, followed by Herta, Fernandez, Fittipaldi, DeFerrin, Andretti, Moore, Pappas, and Vassar. We'll be back to talk with our new champion. Fourth year in a row, a Chip Ganassi car is won at the Toyota Grand Prix of Long Beach. This time, the name is Juan Montoya. The celebration very definitely underway. Quick look at the results of this race with Montoya winning it, followed by Franchitti, Herta, Fernandez, Fittipaldi, DeFerrin, Andretti, Moore, Pappas, and Vassar. There's your back ten. Now, let's go to Gary Gerald. Already here in this magnificent victory podium, Juan Montoya, your third champ car race. Did you at any point think that you might be able to make the transition so quickly that you could become a winner in just your third race? Uh, yeah, I think, you know, we've done a quite good job. Mm, Japan was very close to win, but we run out of fuel. And here we just had it absolutely right. The car worked beautiful all the race. Uh, we did a mistake in qualifying, and it wasn't that bad after all, you know. We could go by everyone, and I think just thanks to all the guys and thanks everyone in Colombia that followed me, my girlfriend, everyone. Tell me what happened now when you're chasing Tony Kanaan and suddenly he had the problem. Do you think you pressured him into a mistake? But I was pushing him quite hard. We were running quite lean in field, so we we're, were looking very good. And I would just start pushing, pushing, trying to show him the nose, and he started making a couple of mistakes. His car starts to slide, and whoa. It was funny because I went to turn, and whoa, he just kept going straight. Thank you. <laughs> Four straight wins for Ganassi and Target Racing. Congratulations. Great drive. Thank you very much. Jan Bikas? Well, it was also a great drive for Dario Franchitti, but you're not as happy. You seem discouraged, but it looked like you gave it everything you had. Yeah, I gave it everything. You know, we didn't have the car today, which was unfortunate. We were just lacking a little bit, but my guys at Team Cool Green, they, the stops are good. I mean, they, I have to say the stops were excellent. They kept us in the hunt all day. But on the track, we just weren't fast enough today. So, you know, second place is good points for the, for the series, but... Uh, you know, it's uh, first loser, but there we go. All right, Dario Franchitti, with the man and with the talent that he has on the street circuits, a bit disappointed. Paul? So with the points, Greg Moore, uh, they finished well enough to stay in the lead of the points. Adrian Fernandez in second to Farron moving up. But uh, you're going to see that name Montoya as he's now seventh right off the screen there. And it will come forward. Don't forget May 2nd, the Cart Nazareth 200 will have coverage both on Cart today on ESPN2 and on ESPN. What a great day to celebrate the silver anniversary of the Toyota Grand Prix of Long Beach. Thanks for being with us. I'm Paul Page with Parker Johnstone, Gary Gerald, and Jan Bikas. See you in Nazareth.